you guys can take a seat. Well, it is a special day at Provision Church today. We are one year old, which is uh, Two things. Number one, if you knew how, how few churches live a year, like how, how rare it is and what an act and a move of God it is for a church to be birthed and a church to last a year, you'd be more excited. And, and number two, and probably more importantly, if you knew how dumb I am, you would know that it is absolutely a miracle of God that this church is, that this church is still here. So let's, let's do better than a golf clap. We're a year old today. Praise God. Praise God. We got some cupcakes after the service and a year old photo booth for, well, mostly for your kids who like cupcakes. But if you like them, I like them. You don't, you don't get to look like this without liking cupcakes. So we're going to eat those after the service. We're a year old, and I'm just so excited about what God is doing and has done. I know that the best is yet to come. And we're continuing our series this morning, the hashtag, the struggle is real. And last week we talked about contentment in a world that's set up to keep us discontent. And I'm really excited for next week. I want to talk about authenticity because I don't think we live in a culture that creates a whole lot of space for that. Our world is cropped, edited, and filtered to perfection. But this morning I want to talk about this area where the struggle is real for every single one of us. This area that is often the deepest struggle in our lives, this area that provides us with our highest highs and our lowest lows, some of our greatest joys and our deepest suffering, some of our worst pain and hurt, and some of our absolute greatest moments, and this is area of relationships. We are built, designed, and wired for relational intimacy, and there's something inside all of us that longs for connection. But we're living in a world that's changing very rapidly. And that change, specifically in the area of technology and social media, has had and is having a profound impact on the way that we connect with one another. Like even for the generation here who doesn't do social media and doesn't do smartphones, this message is for you because you're living in a culture that is so ingrained, so bought in, hook, line, and sinker to social media and to technology that you're going to have to communicate cross-culturally with some of those people. And this message is for all of us who haven't quite perfected the area of relationships with other people in our lives. And here's the deal. Like for all the good that it's done and for the ways that technology and social media have connected us to a vast network of people who are not close in proximity geographically, the truth is that it has the ability to cut us off from real relationship and rob us of the things in our lives that are most important. Sociologists look at America today and say that we are a culture connected more broadly and less deeply than ever before. The average user of Facebook has 155 friends, but the average American says they have two close intimate friends, and that's down significantly from six close intimate friends 25 years ago, and over one quarter of Americans say that they have zero close intimate friendships, and we are built, we are designed to know and be known. The struggle is real. And this morning as we talk about intimacy in relationships, about the God who created us and how he created us to, to love him and to love one another, I want us to filter everything. I want you to filter everything that I say and everything in this message and everything in your lives and in your relationships through the lens of, of this passage that we're going to read. If you have your Bibles or your Bibles, open them up to the book of John. It's the fourth book in the New Testament, chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 34. And I just want us to see everything this morning and just look at all of our relationships this morning through the lens of these words of Jesus. And check it out. When we start reading in verse 34, Jesus had just done something totally radical. Like right before he says this, he got his disciples around a table, and then he did something that the lowest servant in a household should do. He got a basin of water, and he got a towel, and he walked around, and he took their feet, and he, and he washed off their dusty, grimy, gross, dirty feet, and it was just this incredible act of self-sacrifice, this mind-blowing act of love, and they couldn't believe that he was doing it, and right on the tail end of doing that for his disciples, Jesus said these words. He looked at me and said, a new command I give you. A time out real quick. Put yourself in the disciples' shoes for a minute. Or 
historically their sandals with freshly washed feet inside of them, okay? Here's the disciples, and, and Jesus tells them a new command I give you. And they've grown up as Jews. They know all the commands. And Jesus does this, this crazy thing, and they're a little bit shook still that he would even do that for them. And he says, a new command I give you. What do you think they're thinking? Like, they are zoned in. They're not glossing over. They're like, oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> he's going to give us something new. And Jesus is looking at him, and when he says a new command I give you, what he's telling them is this. I'm going to flip the script for you. He's saying, look at all, all you guys, you grew up in this culture that taught you that, that going through the motions of faith was what was important, that knowing the right things about God is what was important, that doing the right sacrifices and avoiding the right sins was how you were going to be known as a good Jew. It was how the pagans were going to see you and know that you belonged to God because you did the right things and you didn't do the wrong things. This is a new command I give you. I'm going to flip the script. I want to change your paradigm. I want to radically reshape the lens through which you guys see the world. I got a whole new command. Love one another. Love one another as I have loved you. Like when I came down and loved you, when I sacrificed and loved you, when I gave of myself and I loved you, when I washed your feet and loved you, and you don't even know it yet, but in a couple days when I give my life for you like that, that's the way you got to love each other. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Jesus looks here at this room full of guys who are going to build his movement in the world, and he tells them, you ought to stand out. You ought to be different. You ought to be countercultural. But notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say the world's going to know you because you got your theology straight. You know all the right stuff. He doesn't say the world's going to know you follow me because your church attendance record is perfect. He doesn't say the world's going to know you love me because you have a super Christian-y bumper sticker on your car. Okay. It's not that those things aren't important. They are. Well, the first two are. Theology matters. Church matters. Probably more than we give it credit for. The bumper sticker, some of you need to peel that off your car because your driving does not point people towards Jesus. Okay, but like, look at what Jesus doesn't say is that all these traditional methods, all these box-checking methods, all these externals are how people are going to know. He says, the thing that I desperately want my church to be known for, my people to be known for, is the way that they just radically, selflessly love one another. I want the world to look at the church and say, holy smokes, that is different. Those people have something different going on. Look at the way they love. They are followers of Jesus. Okay, and so it's through that lens that vision that Jesus casts for what he wants his people to look like in a broken world, for what he wants his church to be in a broken world. It's through that filter that I want us to think about relationships and intimacy this morning. Because the truth is, that's a, that's a radically different filter to look through than the filter of social media. That's a radically different way to think about relationships than the way our world is used to thinking about how to do relationships. Like technology has caused a tectonic shift in the way that we do friendship and parenting and marriage and work and every single relationship in our lives. I mean, the very idea of relationship and the very definition of the term friendship is evolving rapidly because we now live in a world of continuous accessibility. We all have these in our pockets, okay? Even my dad and my father-in-law and my uncle, who are the three last people on earth I ever thought would have a cell phone and who all swore to me up and down they would never get one, have phones in their pockets now. They're dumb phones, but they have them in their, they have them, they have them in their pockets. I mean, the phone, right? The phone used to be a thing that hung on the wall in your kitchen, right? And we are now living with a generation, they're across the hall right now, who will not even be able to wrap their minds around that concept. They have, they have no idea. The phone used to be something we used to talk to people. Now that's like 5 to 10% of what we do with our phones. Like even the idea of communication has changed dramatically and changed quickly. And two things have happened because we have these in our pockets, I think. Number one, we've learned to crave constant connection. And number two, we've become addicted to immediate affirmation. Let me explain what I mean by that. A while back, someone shot me an email with a link to uh, a clip of the comedian Louis C.K. on Conan O'Brien. And Louis C.K. Is, is crass for all of his faults, and he has many. He has a unique and powerful ability, like a lot of comedians do, to look deep into the human condition and to provide some powerful social commentary. And Louis C.K. was talking to Conan O'Brien about why he doesn't want to get his kid a smartphone, and, and he just observed that every single one of us as human beings have this hole inside of us that hates to be alone, that's afraid of being alone, that doesn't like loneliness. And he's absolutely right. 
We're built to know and be known. He said, but, but now that we have phones in our pockets, we never ever have to feel that anymore. Like that hole inside of us, that lonely feeling, we are one phone away from not feeling lonely anymore. And so we, we just get out our phones constantly because we constantly want to make sure that that, that hole and that feeling of loneliness doesn't exist in us. And he said we get to this place where, be, where, where, where it becomes a craving in our lives. We just, we just need it. Where we can't sit any longer just with ourselves and our thoughts and just be human. Because our phone is in our pocket begging, begging, begging us to connect. And he went on to observe, and, and Louis guesstimated that approximately 100% of people text while driving these days. And he had this quote that I thought was, was powerful and uh, convicting. He said, we've gotten to the place where we literally risk taking someone else's life and ruining our own because we're terrified of being alone even for a few seconds. And I think that rings true for a lot of us. And, and sometimes it's not just that we're terrified of being alone. We're terrified of, of missing out. Like, we're driving along and we feel it buzz. And it's like, well, what if it's a cool picture? What if I miss a good cat meme? Like, well, what could it be? What could it be? Or, or like, what if it was an important text? Or what if it's an emergency? And, and what if it's an invitation to do something? And what if, 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 what if? And we do it because we're terrified of being alone and we're terrified of missing out. We just have this craving for constant connection because it's available to us. And we're addicted to immediate affirmation. And the first feeling of loneliness or, even, or loneliness or even the first feeling of sadness. You know what? Sadness is a real emotion that's part of living as a human being in a broken world. But as soon as we start to feel it, we don't want to go there. And so we pull out our phones. We pull out our phones and we're like, I, I feel a little bit sad. I feel a little bit lonely. You know what I need? I need some affirmation. I'm going to take a selfie. I'll take a selfie real quick. I got to do this. So let me take like Hashtag duck face selfie. Hashtag preaching. And I can put that on social media right now, and by the time I'm done, I would have some likes, and they would make me feel really good about myself. Maybe I should. I'll see who in this room liked it, and then we can have a talk about using your phones in church. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just used my phone in church. But, like, but like we, we do it because we want to get likes. Cause we don't want to dive in to, to what that feeling of sadness or what that feeling of loneliness might really get, and it keeps us from ever, ever getting too low. And this isn't just social science. This is, like, hard life sciences. This is biology. When people like our pictures on Facebook, it releases a chemical in our brains called dopamine, and dopamine feels good. And so we crave it. And we use social media, and we use the internet as a way to self-medicate, to dope ourselves into making sure we never feel too low, and we never feel too lonely. We just get the dopamine, and we get the dopamine, and we get the dopamine. But there's a byproduct and a catch to doing that. And the catch is that Medicating ourselves by seeking immediate affirmation cuts us off from ever filling the need, the actual need, the real need, the deep need that we're desperately trying to fill. That relational need for connection that we're built with as human beings. It's this new phenomenon psychologists have termed deferred loneliness. We feel alone, so we post something and someone likes it, and we don't feel alone anymore, and we solved that feeling, but we didn't come close to solving that need. That need for intimacy, that hard wiring built into us to know and to be known. At the end of the day, this is true. We are longing for love. So we got to stop living for likes. There are a whole lot of people in our world who have never felt more connected and at the same time never felt more alone. And they know and we know that deep down we're longing for something more and something better than the superficial connection that we get across a screen. But that's the world and the culture that we live in. So how do we get from here to there? How do we get to the lives and, and the relationship that we, were connect, or that, that we were created for by our creator? How do we connect like that? My answer, I got to warn you, is like almost uh, insultingly simple. Okay, so please don't be offended that, that I give it. I just know in my own life the struggle is real. The struggle is real in the area of relationships. The struggle is real in the area of technology and social media. And so I'm going to offer us two things that you already know. Two really simple action steps that I think can absolutely shift the way and radically shift the way that we relate to one another and that we fill up that deep hole and that need in our lives. These two basic principles for doing life together the way that we were created to do it and for being and becoming a community of that, of just crazy love that the world looks at and is compelled by. And, and both of these steps, both of these ideas I have this morning are grounded in who God is. 
Okay, the, the very first chapter, the very first big idea in the Bible is in chapter 1. And it tells us that God created on purpose, and that he created us on purpose for relationship with him, and that he created us in his image. And so if we're created for relationship in the image of God, maybe, just maybe, there's some things about the image of God that show us and tell us how to do relationship. And so what I want to do this morning is just dig into two characteristics of who God is. Specifically, two names for God that are used in the Bible to describe God and who he is that I hope will help us see and then hopefully emulate how God wired us to do relationship. And the first one is this, Emmanuel. Okay, God identifies himself in the Bible as Emmanuel, and this is the name that the Old Testament prophecies use for Jesus. This is compound Hebrew word that literally translates God with us. God with us. And what in the world does God with us have to do with relationships and social media and what we're talking about this morning? Well, check it out. God desperately wanted us as human beings who were cut off from him because of our sin to know that he loves us. And in order to tell us that he loves us, he didn't shout it from heaven. He didn't let us know from across a screen or across a great distance. What God did was he rolled up his sleeves and he came to be with us. He stepped out of all of his heavenly glory and he became a human. He lived with us. He showed love to the people that people said were unlovable. He showed grace to the people who didn't deserve grace. He showed compassion to the people who his world and the religious people of his day said were the grossest and the worst and the least worthy. He touched the untouchable. He rolled up his sleeves and he showed us. He didn't shout it from heaven when he wanted us to know that he loves us. And when it comes to our relationships, I think so often, I, I know I'm guilty of this, so often we settle for so much less. So our first really practical, insultingly basic action step today is turn up. Turn up in people's lives. We need to be intentional about practicing presence in the lives of the people around us. About actually showing up, turning up, and being with one another. There's power in presence. Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25 implores us, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, fight to get together. Fight to be there. Stop making excuses. Stop coming up with any reason in this world why you shouldn't be together. I know that it's easy to make excuses for not getting together, but you need to be with one another. And when you get together, you need to show love and show encouragement. Turn up. I want everyone to say this with me. I want everyone to say, I will love people. All right, on the count of three, we're going to say that. One, two, three. I will love people. That wasn't very hard, was it? I'm going to crank it up a notch. Now on the count of three, I want us to say, I will love people face to face, not just thumb to thumb. All right? One, two, three. I will love people face to face and not just thumb to thumb. That's a whole different level, isn't it? That's a whole different level of love. That's a whole different level of presence in people's lives. But we got to intentionally love people with that real genuine type of love. And we can only do that in proximity. Romans 12, 9 and 10, Paul encourages us. He says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. He's saying, hey, love has to be authentic. For it to really be love, for it to really meet that need that we were created with, to know and to be known, it's got to be real and it can't be faked. And you can fake it through a screen. It's really easy to hop on here and like something that you don't really like but you want someone to feel good or you want them to like your stuff back so you can feel good about yourself it's really easy to fake it in a social media driven world but it is not easy to fake it face to face he says if we're going to show love we got to be present if we're going to live out the image of god with us and this vision that jesus has to be a church that loves we got to be sincere and we got to be real we got to turn up and be present in each other's lives we got a hypothetical for you. Say after church today, you, you go home and you log on to Facebook or you get a text or an email or a call and a friend has really bad news. Like your friend lost their job or got dumped by his girlfriend on his birthday or something like that, you know? Some just really terrible, crushing news or maybe like serious bad news that's, that's deeper than that. And some of you are in that situation. Like what's an acceptable way to show love? Most of us, the first thing we're going to do, shoot off a text, thinking of you praying for you. Maybe, maybe you're even take it to the next level. Go to Walgreens and buy a card that says thinking of you. Whatever that even means. I've always found that phrase to be creepy. I, thoughts aren't dollars. Like, if you really care. But, like, thinking of you. But, but whatever. That's a nice thing to do, right? We, we get a card thinking of you. Okay? That's, 
that's, that's great, but what if, what if we resolve this morning that we're going to live out the image of God with us? That we're going to do love the way that Jesus pitched it to the disciples. We're going to live out that vision of how to love each other. Then maybe, maybe a text isn't enough. Maybe you need to pick up this thing and use it for something you haven't used it for in weeks to actually speak with someone else to ask them questions and to hear the tone of their voice. And I guarantee you that an actual conversation with a human being is going to take you places that text and Facebook never could. You know what makes an even bigger difference? Turning up in person. I went there. I know it's hard. I know it's so much easier and it's so tempting in our own self-centered, navel-gazing lives to just shoot off the text and say I did enough. But showing up in person makes a difference. Maybe just don't text and maybe just don't call. Maybe if we're going to be like Jesus, we got to roll up our sleeves and do it face to face. Show up and celebrate. Show up and ask real questions. Show up and cry. Just show up. And one of the things that haunts me is I realize in my own life, this idea of, of turning up in people's lives and being present face to face is a concept that I have not grasped and I have not embraced as well as Nacho Libre did. Okay? Here in this picture, we have a monk who just really wants to be a professional wrestler, a luchador. But when people are in need and when people are dying, what does he do? He fires up his little bike and he shows up at their house. And you may have no idea who Nacho Libre is and that's okay. All I want you to know is be like this glorious man in blue, okay? <laughs> be like him. Because when people are in need and when people are desperate, Nacho turns up. That's what Jesus would do. Be like Jesus, be like Nacho. Show up, okay? And sometimes it makes all the difference. I remember one of my first ever hospital visits as an official pastor, right? Like I was, I was a young pastor and I had literally no idea what I'm doing. Still don't, but I'm learning. But like I, I showed up and I, I was driving there. I was really nervous and I, I was praying the whole time. And I had, I had these talking points like hidden in my Bible, the stuff I was going to say. And I, I was going to visit a teenage girl. She's an incredible young woman who was in a fight for her life with an eating disorder. And I had some Bible verses highlighted, and I had some thoughts, and I just, I knew she was going to be there. I knew her family was going to be there, and I wanted to share something profound that would make a difference. And so I'm praying as I walk in, like, God, give me the wisdom to say something profound. And I sat there, and when I walked in, she was fighting with her doctor, like just down and out, screaming, arguing, because she had already had one protein shake, and she had already eaten 300 calories that day, and she was done. She didn't need any more, and her doctor disagreed. And I sat there and I watched that for 10 minutes and every good idea that I had, and every little talking point in my Bible felt pfft, useless, okay? I saw, I'll never forget, I sat there for an hour with her family and I said absolutely nothing useful. You know, and I just, I talked and I asked some questions and I prayed with her mom and dad and I felt like a complete failure. I, like, I walked back out to my car and I drove 30 minutes home cried my eyes out for 30 minutes because I thought she is going to die. I knew she was going to die. And I had just totally sucked as a pastor. And I saw her family, like her parents, the next Sunday at church and they came up and they said, thank you so much for showing up. You have no idea how much that meant to us that you, that you came. You have no idea how much that meant to her that you came. Like that was a turning point moment that, that, that you came. You have no idea how much it meant. And I realized, holy smoke, sometimes just showing up, it, it makes the difference. Because I didn't offer any great wisdom. Like I walked out of there feeling like a complete failure, but the fact that I showed up made all the difference. Be present. Turn up. Okay, number two. The second name of God that gives us a picture of just like how to do the kind of relationship that we were created for is this, Elroy. Admit it, you all thought Elroy was a hillbilly name. It's not true. Maybe it's true, but that's not the point. Like, Elroy means the God who sees me. God who sees me. And not just sees me superficially, like I tell my kids, I see you, when they say, look, dad, and then they jump like an eighth of an inch off the ground for the ninth consecutive time. Like, I see you, I see you. Like, not just that, but like the God who sees, the God who is so deeply emotionally invested in us, like for, for whatever stupid reason that, that is unfathomable, he cares about you and me. Even though we don't deserve it, even in the midst of our brokenness, he just, 
He cares so much that he sees us, that he knows our heart. The God who wants to know me, the God who sees. How do we live out this image of the God who sees? As a people defined by love in a broken world, we tune in. The second obscenely simple step is to tune in. And check it out, tuning in is different than turning up in our world, and we all know that that's true. It's really easy in 2016 to be physically present in a place and to not be tuned into the people around you. If you don't believe that, go out to eat for lunch. Go to a restaurant, and what you're going to see is a whole bunch of people sitting at a table together, ostensibly eating meals at the same time, and what are they all doing? Everybody. Or, or like, at, at the end of the day, like, you're, you finally get your kids to bed, and you sit down with your spouse, or you sit down with your friends, and what do we do? We have mastered the art in the United States in 2016 of being alone together. We are awesome at being alone together, and sometimes that's intentional. I, like, I, I know a season in my life where that was intentional. Um, for a while, Jenny was really addicted to just this smutty soap opera, okay? And every week when it came on, she had to see it, like, she had to see the new episode right when it came out. And some of you maybe have even heard of this show or watched it. it was, I think it was called Downton Abbey, Okay? <laughs> Don't laugh. Old-timey clothes and British accents does not change the fact that that's the young and the restless 100 years ago and an ocean away in <laughs> people. But in a season of busyness, we needed to be, like, together. So we would snuggle up and sit next to each other on a couch, and I would put on headphones and work while she watched Downton Abbey. So, like, sometimes we're alone together on purpose, but most of the time we just do it unconsciously. We're not alone together on purpose. We just slip into that because that's the space that technology has allowed us to occupy. We never slide into being intentional about connecting. We slide into being alone together just unconsciously. We don't even mean to be there, but so often we're in front of screens and we're just alone together and it's something we unthinkingly do. And I was, I was struck by it this week. I was surfing Facebook. <laughs> so here, here I am and I'm surfing Facebook and I saw pictures posted by uh, a former student of mine. She's, she's a college student now studying in Europe for a semester. And she posted this whole string of, of pictures of her European ad adventures. And it struck me because in every one of the pictures, there were people holding cameras or holding phones. I, and the, the scenery was absolutely gorgeous, but it was mostly a bunch of pictures of people taking pictures. And I started to wonder, like, as a society, have we gotten to the point where we're so busy trying to m document our memories? so that we can get immediate affirmation. To take pictures of places and then choose the right filter so those places look beautiful, that we're missing out on actually making the memories. That we're missing out on the people who make those places worth remembering. Or you know, this is true for me too, we're sitting there with kids saying, look, 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 hey, mom, 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 dad, 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 look what I did. But we can't look because we're too busy Pinteresting their Halloween costume or like signing them up for the next sport thing. And we think that that's the thing that's going to change their lives. And, and we're too busy doing that to even look. And of course what they're doing is stupid. It always is stupid. But like they just want us to look. <laughs> One of my heroes is a guy named Jim Elliott. And he's, a, he's a missionary who was murdered in Ecuador. And his wife later published a whole bunch of his journals and they're absolutely phenomenal. But something he said or something he wrote that has profoundly impacted and, and challenged my life is this. Wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. Wherever you are, be all there. I'll tell you what, this would be an easier quote to read and an easier message to preach if my wife was volunteering in the nursery and I could pretend that I'm good at it. Um, but, like, I, and I could tell you that there aren't nights when I'm physically home and mentally working. But this quote has profoundly changed the way I think about how to be present in, in the places that I am. Wherever you are, be all there. Like when I'm with the people that matter, because I'm made in the image of the God who sees, I want to see. I want to tune into their lives. First John 3.18 says this, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. I love that verse because I think it's so easy to say one thing and do another. It's so easy to talk a good game and to just not live it out. But if we're going to be people 
if we're going to be people as individuals, if we're going to be people as a community, as Revision Church, who is known to our world for this radical, incredible, unbelievable, countercultural, selfless, ridiculous, crazy love that Jesus loved us with and he asks us to show to each other and to our world, if we're going to live out the God image in us, if we're going to stop living for quick fixes and start filling up that deep longing of our souls to know and be known, if we're going to do relationship the way our Creator created us to do it, then we got to be intentional about turning up and tuning in. And for me, and for probably a lot of you, that means unequivocally changing the way that we use social media, changing the way that we consume the internet, changing the way we use these devices in our pockets. It means deciding that we are not going to do it the way the culture does it anymore, that we're not going to fake it anymore, that we're not going to settle for superficial relationship anymore, that we are going to be the people God created us to be. We're going to do relationship the way he created us to so that we can fill up that hole inside of us and so that we can shine that light of love to a world that is desperately searching for something to fill the hole and the need for love and community that exists. It means we got to ask people around us where and when we aren't turning up when we need to be and where and when we aren't tuning in to the stuff that actually matters. It means we got to make a decision to live counterculturally. I promised last week that I give some real practical action steps and practical handles throughout the course of this series so we could just try it out. So we could try it out for a little bit and see if doing it the way God says to do it See if living the way that he says he created us to live actually works. And I heard from a bunch of you last week who tried it out and said, hey, that was really awesome. So I decided we'll, we'll do it again. I got, I got two simple challenges this week. They're simple, they're easy, but they're exceedingly countercultural. All right, here's number one. For one week, just one, you don't ever have to do it again if you don't like it. But for one week from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., pretend your cell phone is an old school phone, turn on ring, and leave it in your kitchen. Just put it in your kitchen. Then you'll know if it rings. You can go, and if it's absolutely necessary, go ahead and answer it. And if you get really nervous about that, and you're so, you can check it like once an hour to see if someone texted you something important or you missed a good picture. But like for one week, for three hours every evening, pretend it's a traditional phone and just leave it in your kitchen and see what happens when you are all there, wherever you are. And the second one is also pretty simple. I, I want to invite you, I want to challenge you to spend 20 minutes a day, every day, for one week, talking to another human being. Uninterrupted minutes. You don't, get a, you don't get to like set a timer every time you and your wife pass each other and she tells you to do something. That doesn't count, okay? Like 20 minutes a day, uninterrupted conversation with another human being on this planet. If you're married with young kids, I want to challenge you to make at least three of those days a conversation with your spouse. I don't want to make it seven because chances are since the day your first kid was born, you haven't had 90 seconds to talk to each other, and, it, and I don't want to put pressure on, but you might just find that you still like the person sitting across the table from you, and that it's meaningful to connect to their life, and you might just find that some things work better, like that, that actually talking to each other works better than both laying in bed on your cell phones and texting some like kissy face emojis with a question mark, and then getting back, hashtag headache. Like, I don't know, I got no promises about that one, okay? I don't make any guarantees, but it might just work better to actually have conversations. So I want to invite you for three hours a day, for one week, to pretend your phone is an old school phone and to put it away, and with no screens, no TV, no computer, no phones, for 20 minutes a day, have a conversation with another human being and just see what God does in your heart and see how he fills up that need that exists inside of you to know and be known. Because I'm convinced that if we don't do this, if we don't take a step back and start doing life and doing love and doing relationship in a totally countercultural way, like the authentic, intimate way that we were designed to do them, then we are going to find ourselves. And this next generation that God has given us to steward is going to find themselves increasingly isolated and lonely and dissatisfied. And a broken world that is desperate and dying for connection, seeking something to fill that hole and that void and that deep need, to know and be known that lives inside every human on this planet will miss out because it'll look at a church and it won't see the kind of love that Jesus dreamt his church might be defined by. So for me, I'm, I'm fighting this fight. I will fight this fight because for me, the struggle is real. Like, it just is. And I, I refuse to be mastered by it anymore. I refuse to live my life like 
overcome by the temptation to do shallow relationships because they're easier. I refuse anymore to do it. I refuse to have to have my kids say, look, daddy, a second time because I'm more tuned into a screen that's in front of me than I am to their lives. I won't do it anymore. The struggle is real for me. And if it's real for you, I just want to invite you, try this out. Like, let's turn up and tune in. Let's be the church that Jesus invited us to be so that this world will know his love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your ridiculous, unspeakable, incredible love for us. Lord, I know it's hard in the world that we live in to do relationship well, and it's easy to settle for the superficial, but I just pray we wouldn't do that anymore. God, let us be a people who turn up in the lives of those around us who are in need. Let us be a people who tune in to those around us so that we could live out that vision that you cast for your disciples 2,000 years ago of just being a people and being a community that is so ridiculously loving, that looks so crazily like you that the world can't help but look and say, oh, wow, I want that. God, I just pray that you'd help us do relationship authentically and that you would continue to meet that deep need in us and allow us to meet it in each other to know and to be known. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.